find our opening text this morning. Aren't you thankful for the word of God? Hallelujah. Surely God is good. We trust that you've had a great week this week. Numbers chapter 13, and we'll begin reading at verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Notice these words here. The Lord says, I'm giving it to you. Everybody says, the Lord's giving it to us. Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of your fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. And we're going to skip all the names and tribes for right now. Skip down to verse 17 with me. Numbers 13, 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rohab near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ammon, Shushai, and Tamai, forgive me for my pronunciation, I can't even say pronunciation, <laughs> the descendants of Anak were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eskrol, and they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they carried it between two of them on a pole. Well, that's a lot of grapes. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eskrol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out of the land after 40 days. Everybody say 40 days. 40 days. In fact, just go ahead and underline that in your Bible because that's going to be important here in a minute. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Church, can I tell you that the promised land is a real place? Okay? Can I tell you that heaven is a real place? The place that God is trying to get you to on this earth, on this side of glory, is a real place. Somebody say praise the Lord. Can you feel me? Can you feel a brother this morning? All right. Verse 27. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. In other words, this is the evidence. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in their own sight. And so... We were in their sight. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven. It's yea and amen. And Lord, even you yourself watch over your word to perform it. Lord, it will not return into you void. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your house. 
We thank you that you have protected us and kept us safe another week. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your anointing that we've already felt and enjoyed here this morning. Now, Lord, just anoint us to speak what only you would have us to speak. Anoint our ears to hear, anoint our hearts to receive. May the word of God fall on good ground this morning. And, Lord, we will be quick to give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. amen. And amen. Verse number 30, I want to draw your attention to. Verse 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and ask for permission. Let us go up at once and beg for possession. No, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. I love how Caleb said, we are well able to overcome it. The title of our message this morning is this, we are well able. We are well able. Look at your neighbor and tell him this morning, we are well able. Whatever God has called us to do as an individual, as a child of God, or corporately as a body of believers, whatever that is, whatever God has called us to do, come on somebody, we are well able. Not because of who we are, but because of whose we are. Can somebody say amen? In our reading here today, we find out that the Lord instructed Moses to send out 12 men. Everybody say 12 men. To send out 12 men to spy out the land of Canaan. Twelve men because there was one from each of the twelve tribes of Israel. And these men weren't just any men, but they were leaders in their own respected tribes. Look at your neighbor and say they were leaders. They were leaders. Now, let me say this about the land of Canaan. Canaan was more than just some random territory. Canaan was more than just a, another city on the big the bucket list of cities to overthrow. Well, I think that looks good. We'll just go take it. No. Canaan was the land of promise. I said Canaan was the land of promise. How many have ever received promises from the Lord? How many has the Lord ever given you a word or a promise or spoke something into your spirit, man, and you knew it was God? Come on, somebody. Canaan was the land of promise. If you think back to Sunday school, you will remember the story how Moses, by the hand of God, delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. The children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage, or in other words, they were slaves to the Egyptians. The children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage for 430 long years. Everybody say that's a long time. We've been here at this location for 38 years, and that's a long time. But I tell you what, the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage for 430 years. Now, let me say this. With that thought in mind, how many understand this morning that except for God, everything has a beginning and everything has an ending? Let me say that again. Except for God, because he is timeless, he is eternal. Come on, somebody. He's the God of eternity past. He's the God of the present. And he's a God of eternity future. He's always has been and he always will be. Except for God, everything has a beginning and everything has an ending. The children of Israel were slaves to the Egyptians for some 430 years. But how many know that when God says it's time to move, then guess what? It's time to move. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's time to move. So the children of Israel who were led by Moses leave Egypt, but they don't, they just don't sneak out of Egypt. Come on somebody. They just don't decide one night that, Hey, we're going to get everybody together and we're going to make a run for it. No, the children of Israel leave Egypt with their guns ablazing. How many would say amen? After 430 years, God says, okay, you know what? Enough is enough. 
And I wish we had time this morning to go back and look at all the things that transpired and led to their departure. It's an amazing story. How many would say amen? amen. Moses, who by the way was raised in the very house of Pharaoh. Come on somebody. How many know the Lord will make a table before you in the presence of your enemies? I wish somebody would help me preach this morning. Moses, who by the way was raised in the house of Pharaoh, and that story in itself is a miracle. Amen. Remember how J- Jochebed, who was Moses' mother, placed Moses in a basket and put him in the Nile River. Anybody remember the story? Amen. To make a long story short, Pharaoh's daughter ends up finding Moses in the river as she is washing herself, and she takes Moses in as her own. But then not knowingly, she allows Jochebed to nurse her, own, her very own child. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Oh, how many know God knows what he's doing? I said, how many understand that God does some pretty amazing things if you just let him be God in your life? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. If we could just wrap our minds around this. How in the natural realm, oftentimes things seem so bad bad and backwards but I tell you what all things are working together for our good can somebody say amen Amen. but later in life Moses he refuses to be counted with the Egyptians even though he was raised in Pharaoh's house and had all the uh, amenities so to speak all the comforts Moses refuses to be comforted in the house of Pharaoh But instead, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. That's what the Word of God says about this man named Moses. And so down through the course of time, we see God's hand on Moses. Now, we know the story that Moses was called to lead God's people out of Egyptian bondage. And at 40 years old, Moses in his youth and his eagerness he took his he took things into his own hands how many know sometimes we have really good intentions but we're just not we're not right on the timing we're not right on the way we're doing it but at 40 years old Moses knew who he was he knew he was called to lead God's children out of bondage and he took matters into his own hands and he slays the Egyptian and because of that he has to run to the backside of the desert for fear of his life And how many understand that 40 years later, come on now, 40 years later, Moses is out in the wilderness. And you know what? I'm going to be real personal with you. I'm going to be real truthful with you. I don't think even Moses could even care less at this point in time. You say, why would you say that? Well, 40 years is a long time. I said 40 years is a long time to wait on God's promise in your life. Come on, somebody. And so Moses is walking by and he's out in the wilderness, the desert, wherever he's at. And there's a burning bush. There's a bush that catches fire. And that's not so weird because, you know, it's the desert, the heat of the day, spontaneous combustion. But there was something different about this burning bush because it would not be consumed. How many know our God is a consuming fire? You know the story. The Lord says, hey, Moses, remember that word I gave you? Remember that promise? It's time. Well, guess what? Moses wasn't ready. I think he'd kind of given up on the word and the promise and said, well, God, you know, I don't know about this. I was ready 40 years ago, but I'm an old man. I'm 80 years old. I'm slow of speech. I'm this, I'm that. Come on, just like us humans to make excuses. And then God says, okay, listen, I'm going to send your brother with you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to tell you what to do. 40 years. Finally, God gets Moses in a place where he can use him. But church, can I tell you, in those 40 years of what Moses probably seemed like desolation and isolation, God was preparing him. Look at your neighbor and say, God is preparing you. For years, I believe God has been preparing us and grooming us for such a time as this. How many would say amen? So to make a long story short, 
Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Much to the dismay of Pharaoh, even after the ten plagues. Boy, you just forget how much is in this story, don't you? I mean, this is, this is loaded. Moses, he leads them on a trip that should only take 11 days. Everybody say 11 days. Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He's going to lead them to the promised land as God has told him. And this trip is only going to take 11 days. So one of the questions this morning is this. How does an 11-day journey turn into 40 years? How does an 11-day journey turn into 40 years? Now, we're not necessarily going to take the time to answer that here this morning, but you can get in the Word and study it out for yourself. And so through fear, doubt, and unbelief, perhaps even rebellion, an 11-day journey turns into 40 years. And I, I guess I just kind of gave you the answer to that question, didn't I? But through fear, doubt, and unbelief, an 11-day journey turns into 40 years. But even then, the hand of God was still with the children of Israel. Now, church, let me say something here, and I, I have to choose my words wisely because I don't want to give anybody a, a false sense of security. When God puts a call on your life, when God puts a mandate on your life, and how many know we're all here for a reason? We're not here by accident. Amen. But God has called us from time and space and placed us into his kingdom for such a time as this. But when God puts a call and a mandate on your life, how many understand he knows what he's doing? And he knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And he knows that somewhere in between the process, from the promise to the provision, the process, the problem, he knows you're going to mess up. He knows I'm going to mess up. But you know what? Nothing that ever happens in our life ever takes God by surprise. Come on, somebody. And what that means is God can make a way, and he does make a way of escape. He makes a way of provision for us. So what should have been an 11-day journey turns into 40 years. But the hand of God was still with the children of Israel. In spite of their fear and doubt and unbelief and grumbling and griping and complaining. Come on, somebody. That's called the grace of God. Somebody say amen. amen. God is graceful and merciful to us. Long-suffering. Yeah? You've been there and done that? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Even through all of that, the hand of God was still with the children of Israel. Remember the pillar of fire at night? The pillar of fire at night was to keep them warm because how many know it even gets cold out in the desert at nighttime? The pillar of fire was there for, for, for their protection to keep away the wild animals. The, the pillar of cloud by day to, to block the blazing sun of the desert. Fresh manna every day to give them something to eat. Water out of the rock. Come on, somebody. We're talking about a supernatural God caring and providing for his children. Children who are still living in disobedience and, and, and fear and doubt and unbelief. But, but God has a plan. Amen. So he doesn't give up on his people. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and tell him God has a plan for your life. You see, that's why he hasn't given up on you yet. He's got, he's got a job for you to do. He's got a job for me to do. He's got a job for this church to do. Come on, somebody. The pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, fresh manna, water out of the rock. The Bible talks about their clothes didn't even wear out. Shoes on their feet didn't wear out. Come on, somebody. In fact, the Bible says that there wasn't a feeble one among them. Somebody say, that's the kind of God I serve. So now think about this. Think about this. Man, the Lord dropped this in my spirit, and I was like, yeah, Lord, we got we to write that down. We got to say that. The children of Israel were living in divine health way back in the Old Testament before the cross. Can somebody say amen? Woo! Not a feeble one among them. 
Think about that. Even through their disobedience and fear and doubt and unbelief, they were still walking in divine health. Mm. How many know you can never be good enough to earn salvation? You can never be good enough to earn healing. You just got to receive it as a free gift. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> What's better than divine healing? How about divine health? Come on, somebody. That's a whole nother message. We ain't got time to go there. But now let's stop and kind of think about all this here. The will of God for the children of Israel. What is it? Well, it's an 11 day straight, it's an 11 day journey, straight shot, boom, out of Egypt to the promised land. That's the will of God. Everybody say, that's the will of God. That's the will of God for the children of Israel. The will of God was for them to go up and take the land of Canaan which was their own promised land to begin with. Come on, somebody. The will of God was for them to go up and take the land of Canaan, to take the promised land, and to do it right then. Everybody say right now. Not 40 years later, but now. Now. But because of their fear and their doubt and their unbelief, they literally stopped what God was ready to do for them Right then. I want you to think about that. You say, well, pastor, you just said nothing takes God by surprise. No, it doesn't. He knew that they were going to do this. He knew that it was an 11-day journey, but he knew what was going to transpire. He knew the fear, doubt, and unbelief in their hearts. And you know what? It was going to take 40 years to get it out of them. If not, he was going to kill them and raise up somebody else. Hmm. All right. I'm getting ahead of myself. Forgive me. But they literally stopped what God was ready to do for them right then. Now, let me ask you this question. Have you ever wondered why it took 40 years? Why not 35 years or 45 or 42 or 38? Some say that 40 years represents an unbelieving generation. And that's a very good point. And I'm going to show you what happened to that generation here in a minute. But look at this. Let me show you here why it, why it had to be. 40 years. Numbers chapter 14. Look at this. We're talking about this morning. We are well able. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 14. Verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complains against me? I have heard the complaints with the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do it to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and up or above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Wow. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, remember, they, they, they said to Moses, Moses, what have you done? Brought us out here to die in the wilderness? Boy, they just prophesied their own doom and despair right there, didn't they? But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, Watch this. I will bring them in and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, the unbelieving generation, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Why is this? Verse 34, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Wow. Can somebody say wow? So we see here that the 12 spies were spying out the land of Canaan for 40 days. How many know numbers are significant? They spied out the land of Canaan for 40 days. 
Thus God said you're getting a year's sentence for each day of your unbelief. Forty years of unbelieving, or I'm sorry, 40 days of unbelieving by the ten spies led to 40 years of God's judgment. How many know obedience is better than sacrifice? If we be willing and obedient, we shall eat the good of the land. Church, listen, I know we don't always understand what God says to do, but if you really know it's God, just do it. Just do it. Now, we, we really need to see this here this morning because the Lord miraculously delivers the children of Israel from Pharaoh and his armies. How many remember the crossing of the Red Sea? Another significant event in this whole timeline of things. There's just so many amazing parts to this story. I mean, it's just one miracle after another that God provides for his children. And God sets them up for what's going to be an 11-day journey, boom, straight into the promised land. But along there, he stops and he commands Moses to send out the 12 spies and spy out the land of Canaan before they get there. But out of the 12 spies that were sent in to spy out the land, 10 of them came back with gripes and only two came back with grapes. Let me say that again and you might want to write that down. Out of the 12 spies that were sent in, 10 came back with gripes. Only two came back with grapes. How many understand when you make up your mind to do the will of God, you're not always going to be in the majority? but in the minority. <clears throat> now think about this. Because all of the 12 spies each saw the very same thing. Did you get that? Yes. All 12 spies, each one from a different tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel, all 12 spies seen the exact same thing. In other words, it's not what you see that's important, but how you perceive it, how you see it. Are you looking through the eyes of your flesh, of the natural carnal man, or are you looking through the eyes of faith and seeing what God wants you to see? Can somebody say amen this morning? Joshua and Caleb saw the very same things as the other ten spies. But something was different about Joshua and Caleb. I said something was different about Joshua and Caleb. Aren't you thankful that God always raises up a church within a church? A people within a people. A generation within a generation. Leaders within leaders. They were all leaders. But ten of them couldn't see what God was trying to do for them. My God. But Joshua and Caleb were different. How many understand faith will cause you to see what other people cannot see? Look at this in Matthew, or I'm sorry, Numbers, chapter 14, verses 22. Look at this. Numbers 14, 22. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness... And have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a what? Because he has a different spirit in him and has allowed me fully Come on, somebody. They're all children of God. They're all leaders within their 12 tribes. But Caleb has a different spirit within him, and he has followed me fully. Therefore, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Can somebody say, it pays to trust the Lord? It pays to have faith in God. It pays to take God at his word. So I believe we're starting to see here that yes, there's something different about Joshua and Caleb. Some would call them optimists. 
while the other ten spies would be pessimists. But church, can I tell you, it's more than that. There's something really different about these two men, Joshua and Caleb. How many have ever known somebody that you just couldn't put your finger on it, but you just knew they were different? Just the way they talked and acted and carried themselves and not saying that they're perfect, but they're just, they're different. They're set apart. Now let's think about this here. What else do we know about Joshua and Caleb? Well, let's look here in Numbers chapter 13. We're going to try to find out here because how many want to be numbered with Joshua and Caleb and not the, the other ten spies? I, I think if we want to be numbered with Joshua and Caleb, we've got to figure out what they got going on. What's, what's going on with Joshua and Caleb? Let's look at it here. Numbers chapter 13, verse 6. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb the son of Jephunneh. So in other words, Caleb was out of the tribe of Judah. And then verse 8, Numbers 13, 8. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshe or, Hoshe or Joshua the son of Nun. So here we see from the word of God that Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. And Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Now, here's where it starts to get good. Everybody say, this is where it starts to get good. If you do your homework and break down the 12 tribes of Israel and look at what each tribe means or represents, then one must look at the tribes in which Joshua and Caleb were from. Right? Does that make sense? If we're saying, hey, I want to be counted with Joshua and Caleb, I want to be like them, then, then let's stop and analyze them. Where are they from? Who are these men? Now, are you ready to shout this morning? Amen. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah, and Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Now, most of the church today knows that Judah means praise, Right? Everybody say Judah means praise. And we know that praise not only does a body good, but praise will fight battles that no other power can fight. Come on, somebody. When you can't pray your way out of it, you got to praise your way up out of that thing. Judah means praise. So then, what was different about Caleb was the fact that he was not a complainer, but he was a praiser. Come on, somebody. Caleb was not a complainer. He was a praiser. And how many know God inhabits the praises of his people? Praise and worship will bring the presence and the anointing of God like nothing else can do. Everybody say Caleb was a praiser. That was his destiny in life. He was from the tribe of Judah. Praise was in him. How many want praise to be in you? Guess what? If praise ever gets in you, it ain't going to stay. It's got to come out. Come on, somebody. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah, and he was a praiser. But now what most of the church doesn't know is what the tribe of Ephraim means or represents. The tribe of Ephraim, anybody ready to shout? The tribe of Ephraim means double fruitfulness. How many know the anointing attracts anointing? Man, you get two or three Holy Ghost filled people together and there's something about the anointing just intensifies. My Lord, have mercy. When you get Joshua and Caleb together, then you're putting praise and double fruitfulness together and honey, you better watch out. My, 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 my. Woo. Jesus. How many know this thing is real? My Lord, have mercy, this thing is real. How many understand you can't fake what Sister Denise got up here and said this morning? You can't manufacture that. You can't make that happen in your own strength or talent. or That's a God thing. Can somebody say amen? amen. My Lord, have mercy. Ephraim means double. 
fruitfulness. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you're getting double for your trouble, honey. My Lord, have mercy. You might as well just go ahead and praise him. Because you're getting double for your trouble. It might take 40 years, but we're going to get it. One way or another. <clears throat> Church, I don't know about you, but I believe we're well able to take the land. I believe we're well able to do what God has called us to do. How many know, understand God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the called? We've come a long ways. Look at your neighbor and say, we've come a long ways. And the best part is God isn't through with us yet. Hello? I said, God's not through with, with us yet. The best is yet to come. <laughs> now, as we prepare to close here today, let me say this. <clears throat> God will lead you to the door of your promised land, but it's up to you to go in and possess it. And why is that? Because it all comes down to choice. It's a choice thing. Everybody say it's a choice. It's a choice. God will lead us to the door of our promised land, but it's up to us if we're going to go in and possess it. Look at this in Joshua chapter 18. Joshua chapter 18 verse 1. Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there. And the land was what? The land was subdued. What does subdued mean? It means it's accessible. You can take it. There's no contention. The land was subdued before them, but, everybody say but, verse 2, but there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Then Joshua said to the children of Israel, how long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? <laughs> wow. Remember what we said a couple weeks ago? We're not here to take sides. We're here to take over. I said, we're not here to take sides. Come on, somebody. You see, the church is all messed up. We lining up with this group. We lining up with them. We lining up with the Republicans. We rely. Come on, somebody. We're not here to take sides. We're here to take over. We're here to run the show around here. We're here to speak on behalf of the king. Can somebody say amen? My Lord, have mercy. God, help us to get this Holy Spirit. Mm, mm. The Bible declares that the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Church, I believe it's time we stand up and take our God-given rights and authority over the enemy. How many would say amen? The devil was already defeated 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. Come on. All we need to do now is enforce that victory over the devil. Come on, come on. He's already defeated. He's already under our feet. Come on. Jesus has already crushed his head. Come on. My Lord, have mercy. Look at this in 2 Chronicles. I'm closing. I'm hurrying. I promise. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jehel, the son of Matani, and a Levite, the son of Asphat, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God. <laughs> Church, can I tell you right now that thing you're fighting, that thing you're facing, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a sickness or disease or the healing or the, the marriage or salvation of your loved ones or the job situation, whatever it is, that mountain that you're facing right now. Come on, somebody. There are more that are for you than are against you. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? Come on now. Mm, my Lord, have mercy. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. 
You see, church, the, the battle belongs to the Lord, but the victory belongs to you and I. <laughs> Man, don't you, don't you love the way God does these things? He takes our sins, he takes our sickness, he takes our, he takes our disease, but then he gives us his love, his grace, his mercy, his Holy Spirit. Come on, he fights the battle for us, but the victory is ours. How many know we really got it good around here? Come on. Yeah. My Lord Jesus. <laughs> my, 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 my. My last scripture, and I'm through. Praise team, come on, so I'll quit. Jesus said this in Luke 19, 13. We're talking about the fact that we are well able. Jesus said in Luke 19, 13, so he called 10 of his, his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business till I come. I like the way the King James says, occupy till I come. Occupy. Occupy is an old military word where you go in somewhere and you take possession. Church, I believe we are well able. I believe we are well able to take the land. I believe we are well able to do what God has called us to do. But here's the key. We can't waver. We can't second guess God. We can't go and take the side of the ten spies. Come on, somebody. But we got to go take possession now. Now. We have to believe the report of the Lord, and we have to run with it. Amen. And I understand sometimes we don't have all the details. I'm bad about that too. Man, I want details. I want to know when, why, where, how much, how are we going to do it. But the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. So now, here today, I decree and I declare to you the word of the Lord that we are well able. We are well able to take the land. <laughs> oh, I said we are well able to take the land. Mm, I want you to stand with me this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you are so patient with us. And Lord, this is an amazing story. An amazing story of your, of your people, your children that you led through your servant Moses. You led them out of Egyptian bondage. And Lord, if they would have heard your word and received it and would believe, been, believed it by faith, Lord, it would have been an 11 short day journey straight into the promised land. But Father, because of fear and doubt and unbelief and and so many times this fear of the unknown. Lord, they grumble, they gripe, they complain. And because of that, Lord, it cost them not only 40 years, but it, in the end, it ended up costing them their life. Father, I pray that we would see what is set before us. Lord, not only as a church body corporately with this new building, but Lord, I would I, I just pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of your people. And Lord, they would see what you have called them to do as an individual in their own homes and schools and workplaces. Because Lord, there can't be a church unless we have people. And Lord, it's not the... Steve show. It's not us four and no more. Lord, if we're going to go up and possess the land, if we're going to possess this church building, if we are going to shake this city for the kingdom of God, if we are going to fill them 400 chairs, Lord, each and every one of us have to catch the vision. And Lord, I, I have delivered the word that you have given me for this day. Lord, your word says, write the vision and make it plain. Father, we've wrote the vision. We've presented the need to the people. And God, I believe, it's, I believe you're going to move. Lord, I'm reminded of what Brother Mo told us many years ago. I don't think he said it this year, but he said a few years ago, he said if it's God's bill or if it's God's will, it's God's bill. 
And Lord, we just thank you that you're going to provide everything that we need to do your will. Everything. All the people, places, things, resources, finances. God, we move forward in faith believing. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Can somebody say hallelujah? Can somebody say thank you, Jesus? Come on, praise him in the